be the change you want to see. Make a difference by giving your money a purpose, a mission to do good. Welcome to Money with Mission, where we talk to individuals, businesses, and organizations who are taking the lead and whose actions are impacting the well-being of their communities and the world at large. Welcome to Money with Mission. Today, I am excited to have Siri Ibrahim, Ibrahim, who is a financial planner and member of the Bank on Yourself organization. He helps real estate investors, business owners, and full-time employees grow safe and predictable wealth, regardless of market conditions, using a financial strategy that has been around for over 160 years. Siri started his journey when he was in grad school, completing his MBA. He worked for companies like Allstate, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna HealthSpring, and Humana before founding Financial Asset Protection, a financial services company that focuses on one sole concept, the bank on yourself concept. We'll get into that a little bit more. Welcome, Siri. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, Felicia. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Siri and I have had a a back and forth. I had an emergency yesterday when we were supposed to to do this interview and he so graciously agreed to come back a day later. So I really, really appreciate it. So let's get into this. You got your MBA. What school did you go to to get that just for grins so who we can connect with? (laughs) Yeah, I got that from Keller Graduate School of Management in Chicago, in, in downtown Chicago. Are you in Chicago now? Yeah, can you hear the sirens and fire trucks in the No, back? no, I can't hear anything. <laughs> What's, how cold is it there? Right now, it's not that bad. It's like 40 right now. It's starting okay. to get a little bit uh, warmer here. Okay. For, so for Chicago, 40 is a nice day. 45 I, degrees is a nice no, day. I was in Chicago when it was zero and wind was blowing. <laughs> and I thought there is no way. So, And I lived in Minnesota for four years. So I remember uh-huh. when zero felt warm. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I forget. Sometimes I talk to people from California, like Arizona, and they'll go, "How's the weather?" I'm like, "Oh, it's pretty nice out today. It's like 42." <laughs> <laughs> they don't appreciate that exactly. So you've worked for some pretty high name companies: Allstate, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Cigna mm-hmm. Health, Spring Humana. Were you just jumping around trying to find the right place? Tell, tell me about what that was like and why yeah, the- you worked for all those. Yeah, moving around, trying to find the right place, but also the right purpose, the right, the right thing to do. Um, okay. And 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 I did that, and I think that was a, it's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because I got to see different careers, different positions, different products and services that help people. But also, it could kind of be bad because if you keep jumping around, like for for people listening that are kind of uh, jumping around, it doesn't look too good on a resume. But the, which is why I'm an entrepreneur and and hopefully I won't have to worry about the whole application job application part. But uh, I did I did move around a lot to see different types of jobs to to see what I really like to do. And the way I came across this concept, the bank on yourself concept, was just from reading one book. I read this book called The Bank on Yourself Revolution by Pamela Yellen, okay. and the book pretty much talks about this strategy, the bank on yourself strategy. It was invented by Pamela Yellen, and the strategy helps people. Re- take back control of their financial life by becoming their own source of financing. Because Felicia, see, we're all in the Before you go further on that, before Mm -hmm. you go further on that, I'm going to back up a little bit more, um, just to get a little bit more sense of you. What company Mm -hmm. were you aware? Where were you in your traditional W-2 career when you read that book? Mm -hmm. So when I read that book, I was... um, I was doing a couple of things. So I was still an independent broker and I was also consulting too. Um, I was an independent broker. I was a Medicare broker. So I was helping people who were retire, retiring and were merging off of their employer plans mm-hmm. onto their own individually owned Medicare plan. So I was gotcha. helping them make that transition. And then one of my clients actually asked me, he's, he mentioned, you know, if I could help him with life insurance and specifically cash value life insurance. And this and was would, a, I'm sorry, this was somebody you were working with to help them get to their Medicare plan. They were yeah. bring, talking to you about this. Got it. It's interesting how these serendipitous things happen. So thank you for sharing this. Go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, every, yeah. it's just kind of like having your ears, ears and eyes open for certain opportunities. And that was mm-hmm. one of those things. Like what he, my client is the one that kind of just told me about this indirectly. He's like, yeah, there's this life insurance policy. It has cash value. And I was like, that sounds like a good idea. That sounds like it's very helpful for a lot of people. And then it is, yeah. And I did research it. And, and, and one of the ways I like to learn is I like to read books. Uh-huh. That's how I came across the book, The Bank on Yourself Revolution. And it led me to a lot of other books. Like another book it led me to is Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash. Mm-hmm. And this idea of 
taking back control of your financial life. Really, out of all the products, out of all the services I help clients with, this was the one that really like was the most important one, and it brings the most value to clients. Gotcha. Now you ultimately quit your job. Mm -hmm. Talk about that transition. How did you go from reading a book, understanding this principle and saying, Hey, I, I got to bring this to more people. I'm not going to be able to do this job anymore and do what I need to do further down the road. So the good news is I always wanted to quit. Not because I hate it. I like the job. I just always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Gotcha. And okay. when I came across this concept, that's what pushed me over the edge. So I was already on the edge, already looking for ways to escape out of the corporate lifestyle. Um, and this, this concept, this book, this organization I work with just helped me push it a little bit further. Okay. Um, so, so, that, so I think that was, it was kind of the way to make things move faster for me. Um, and I had already, I had already been planning to do it from, from before, you know, got it, got it. So now you found your means, you found your mission. You found the thing that would drive you. That just was your thing to do in the mm -hmm. world to help people mm -hmm. take back their financial control, take back the control of their financial mm -hmm. life. Your, mm -hmm. your podcast, I forgot to tell people, Siri has a podcast called thinking like a bank. I mm -hmm. look at that and I'm just like, okay, what does that mean? Banks think, what do you mean? Banks think, tell me, <laughs> tell me what that is. I don't, I have a clue. It took me, it, and it was, I'm later in life before I really realized banks were actually a business. So mm -hmm. help people understand what thinking like a bank actually is. Yeah. Well, thinking that, so the, the, the title of thinking like a bank came from learning more about the bank on yourself concept. So for okay. example, the bank on yourself concept helps, helps people, not just people, but also companies and, and banks, even banks use dividend paying whole life insurance um, within their financial, within their portfolios. So then that kind of got me thinking like, well, why do banks use this? And I started doing research and um, according to the FDIC, the FDIC recommends that banks have 25% of their tier one capital, their primary reserves in uh, dividend paying whole life insurance because of the safety, the tax advantages, the life insurance parts of that for the executives and the owners of the bank. And then that kind of led me to the next thing where, where I was like, all right, well, banks are obviously very, they're very safe with money. They know a lot about the subject matter of money. So if we're thinking of money, so for example, every business you have your subject matter and then you have your, the, the money matter of it. So let's say, for example, you own a, you're a lawyer, you own a law firm, the legal parts of it, the legal, that's your subject matter. That's your expertise is the law and practicing the law. And then also with, with uh, alongside that is also the financial parts of it, the money part of it, which is different from practicing law. Yes. Um, there's connections between it, but there's differences too. Uh, and you need to know how to think like how, how to run a law firm from the standpoint of, of entrepreneurship and from the subject matter of money, of dealing with money as its own subject matter. And the same is true with banking. So that banks have um, their subject matter as, as money. And then also the, the, the operation part about operations in the background. So okay. money and the subject. I want to, you, you said a lot. So I want everybody to catch up because I don't think most people think that way. When you have a business, you have two things you're working. You have your subject matter, actually mm -hmm. two subject matters, your primary subject matter or the thing you went into that business for assisted living homes. I have assisted living home. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to take care of the elder with memory care. I have to make money. So my other subject matter is the money associated with that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. We put that make, banking's a business. So mm -hmm. their subject matter is just say that part again. Yeah. Their subject matter, two parts, um, the money part, like I already mentioned. And the second part is running the day-to-day -day operations, you know, getting more clients or marketing behind it. But I think in my opinion that banks, the way they think about money, their subject matter, when it comes to money, they are the best at it. They are professionals when it comes to the way money works and arguably be the best at it considering how lucrative the banking industry is for all throughout history, you know, throughout history, banks always have the most money. They have the tallest buildings. They have the most employees. They have the most assets. Um, and it's because of the way they function. And then as I started to learn more about banks, I started to learn that banks are mostly just like middlemen between borrowers and investors. So when you go to a bank and you deposit hundred dollars in the bank account, that bank, you just loan the bank $100. Now that bank is in debt to you, to $100. They take that money and then they go in and invest it with other people's money. And they go in and they loan that money out to other borrowers through credit cards, auto loans, mortgages, construction loans. They go build things with that money. In the background of that, they 
you know, in most situations, you just check an account, you're not getting any interest. And on the savings account, you're getting like 0.01% interest. Mm -hmm. So long story short, banks are just middlemen between borrowers and investors. They're not even using their money. They're using other people's money and leveraging between them. And again, it's because of the subject matter of how much they know about money, how good they are with money. And then it kind of led me like, there's a lot of principles and strategies that banks use that anybody could use. You don't have to be a licensed FDIC insured bank in order to mimic these these strategies. Like for example, this is where the, the podcast Thinking Like a Bank came in, where we, we, we focused it around the core principles of thinking like a bank, which include, but not limited to, um, having safe and predictable income, um, investing or owning real estate, saving on taxes or lowering your tax liability, having the proper allocations of where your money goes, and other things. So we have these core principles that anybody can mimic. Anybody, oh. if you are an accountant or you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you can and mimic these, these ideas that banks use. And you're going to mimic those in your own business, whether you're a lawyer, like you said, mm -hmm. and in and the way you could do it. So basically you're saying I should run myself and my life like a business, like I'm a bank. Is that where you're going with this? Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. You said something a bit ago about banks being conservative. I guess I never really thought about banks being conservative. Tell me, talk me through that a little bit more. And you talked about the whole life insurance policies. I mean, whole life seems like one of those things nobody tells you to do. They always tell you to do term because it's cheaper, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So talk through that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, to, to explain more about dividend paying whole life insurance, um, if it's structured the right way and it's from the right company and built the right way, it could provide a lifetime of guaranteed conservative wealth. So it's going to grow over time predictably and regardless of market conditions. And this is something, this is the reason why banks use this or at least have at least 25% of their tier one capital. So banks have different tiers. Tier one is their primary reserves. Tier two is what they invest out to other people. Tier one is their money. That's the company's, the, the bank's money. Their essential money. Um, and 25% of that is, is located in arguably the safest asset in the world. And that is dividend paying whole life insurance because uh, number one, so the whole life policy, the cash value in it grows at a guaranteed, on a guaranteed basis, and it's not hindered by market conditions. So, so let's say, for uh, example, there's another. Uh -huh. Go ahead. I was going to try to put it into the context of a real estate investor. So I'm a real estate investor mm -hmm. and I own, you know, a 500 unit apartment building and part of my um, spreadsheet is reserves. So is the tier one, my tier one would be my reserves for my apartment building, is that correct? And then my tier two would be money that I'm bringing in from that apartment building that's gonna let me invest in something else. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly, yeah, you got it. So my tier one, I would say, let's say I had $200,000 of tier one reserves, 25% of that needs to be in something as if I'm a bank, if I'm working like a bank, something very conservative that has been predictable over how long has this been around that banks have been doing this dividend paying whole life insurance? For over 160 years. Okay. So it's pretty real. Doesn't mean it won't go away, but it's been around for a very long time. It's going to be a lot more stable than a lot of other things. So that's there. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't have, it doesn't ride the ups and downs of the stock market. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's, it doesn't. Okay. Okay. So I think I hope that makes sense to everybody. You can put it in your own business mind, your reserves. You need 25% of that. If you're thinking like a bank, correct me if I'm wrong, 25% mm -hmm. of your reserves should be in something conservative that you could, that's predictable for you and is going to grow over time. That happens also, correct? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. And there's also... Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I'm just trying to... You were, you were about to head into something else and I forgot what it was. I apologize. You talk fast, man. <laughs> oh, sorry, I do. You got a lot to get out. You got a lot to get out. I know. I know. You want a <laughs> subject matter, and you know it. Let's get it going. Okay. So now we've got our reserves. We got twenty five percent. They they're putting it in a dividend paying whole life insurance, and this isn't just going down to MetLife and getting a whole life insurance mm -hmm. policy, right? There's more to that than just going to a regular broker getting a policy with whatever company. There's a, it's a little bit different to that policy. Is that correct? Yeah, spot on. Exactly. Yeah. It's not something that you could just go to any company or broker and just say, Hey, I, I want whole life insurance. 
this is where the bad rep of whole life insurance comes in. So a lot of people, they don't like whole life insurance because it's, they say it's a terrible investment. They say the cash value grows slowly. And those things could be true if it's not from the right company in the right way. So here's a, here's a checklist for the audience to consider. So number one, it has to be whole life insurance. There's typically three types of life insurance. There's to term, whole life, and universal. Okay. So term is a set period of time. It has a start date and it has an end date. So like either 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Uh, and then once it's what you only pay for life insurance, there's no equity or cash value in it. So you pay, for example, for 20 years uh, of a, a million dollar death benefit. If something happens to you within that 20 year period, your beneficiary would get a million dollars. If nothing happens to you, the insurance company keeps those premium dollars and they give you the option at the end to renew it uh, with underwriting again, to renew the term policy for another 20 years, usually at a rate about five times higher than their first rate because mm -hmm. you're now older and a higher risk of the insurance company. So that's mm -hmm. term. Okay. And then whole life is for your whole life. It has a start date. It doesn't really end unless you pass away or stop making payments to the policy. And the policy does two things. It has life insurance and it has cash value. So of course, this whole podcast is typically talking about the cash value of a whole life insurance policy. Okay. And then the third was universal life. Universal um, it's a combination of term and whole life, but I won't get too, too much into it, too far into it, but it's pretty much a combination of term and whole life insurance. But for the purposes of, of making, th making this easier, we'll talk only about cash value life, whole life insurance. So it has to be whole life insurance. Number two, it has to be from a mutually owned insurance company as opposed to a stock owned insurance company. So okay. mutually owned, a mutually owned insurance company gives their dividends and profits back to the policy owners. It's, it's mutually owned within the customers, within the policy owners. Whereas a stock owned company is owned by the shareholders and the dividends and profits go back to the shareholders. So you need to make sure it's a mutually owned insurance company. Okay. Number three, there needs to be a paid up additions rider. This rider is a part that you add to the policy that helps turbocharge the cash value over time. It also helps with flexibility, meaning some years you can add a minimum and up to a maximum every year of cash value or, or, or in addition to the cash value. This helps with overfunding policies without over committing to higher premiums. Mm -hmm. And this is something that all insurance companies have. They, not every insurance company has a paid up additions rider. So you need to make sure that they have a paid up additions rider. Okay. And then number four, you need to make sure the company is a non-direct recognition company. So what this means is, let's say you have $100,000 in cash value, right? And let's say you're also a real estate investor and you need some money to invest in a deal. You need $50,000 to invest in a deal. You can go to the policy borrow $50,000 from the insurance company, leveraging your $100,000 as cash value. And when it's a non-direct recognition company, they'll pay you interest and dividends on the entire $100,000 as if you didn't touch it. Because technically you didn't touch that money. You borrowed against it from a different source, from the insurance company's funds, leveraging your cash value. Now, if it's a direct recognition company, then you, they'll reduce the dividends and interest they're paying you because of the outstanding loans. So from the top, it has to be whole life insurance, mutually owned, paid up additions rider, and non-direct recognition. Out of the 1,200 insurance companies in the U.S. that sell whole life insurance, this brings it down to three companies that, are, that can do these four things right here. And okay. you want to make sure that you're dealing with an advisor that knows what we're talking about here, that knows what these four things are, and knows the purposes of, of utilizing the strategy. Perfect. I'm going to take a break. Again, you're throwing out so much information. It is amazing. Let's take a breath. Thank you. And you guys will be right back. Money with Mission is a real estate and business investment company that specializes in finding projects that have the potential to give you a great return on your investment dollar and make an impact in the communities where we invest. Make a difference in your life and the lives of others. Go to moneywithmission.com to learn more. Okay, welcome back, everybody. We're back with Siri, and he is just explaining about the four... Tell us again, Siri. I'm sorry. You're throwing out so much information. It's so good. Thank you. You were telling it was us the four, four che the, the checklist, right? Yes. Number mm -hmm. one, so um, yeah, in whole order life to utilize, mm -hmm. has to be whole life. Number two, it has to have a paid up additions rider. Number three, it has to be an indirect recognition. And what was number four? It, it must be from a, a mutually owned company. Mutually owned company as opposed to a stock company. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right. And you said mm -hmm. there are only four of these companies in the country or in the world? In the country, yeah. Okay, in the country. All right. And not every broker is going to direct you that way. You have to be, you have to know something to be able to talk to somebody to understand for them to know what to look for. And when you're talking to them and they don't know what you're talking about, you're talking to the wrong person. 
How many exactly. people are yeah, there that, you, are, yeah. that are working this kind of, a, understand this as much as well as, probably there's nobody that understands. I'm just like, nobody understands it as well as Siri. How about, <laughs> how many people are you working with along with this? Yeah, so out of the Bank on Yourself organization, there's about 200 advisors in North America and okay. Canada and in the US okay. that specialize in this. And, and, and that's one thing I would look for. I would look for somebody who has the specific credentials of Bank on Yourself professional to, to utilize this. Um, just having an insurance license, I don't think is, is sufficient enough to fully structure this properly and for you to even connect it with your goals. Because we're talking about utilizing the strategy for self-banking purposes, for you to think like a bank and for you to become your own source of financing. So this is a very niched part of the insurance and financial services world. It's not something that every financial advisor, financial planner, or insurance agent is going to know about. Um, actually, most of them won't know about this. So make sure it's a bank on yourself professional that you're dealing with. Okay. Now, now I'm a bank. I've got this policy. I've got a hundred thousand dollars of, of cash value or 200,000. However, I've got some cash value there and I am a real estate investor. So I'm saying I'm a passive real estate investor and somebody's brought me this great deal and they want, let's say they want a hundred thousand dollars for me to invest in that. How does that work? And you have a hundred thousand dollars in cash value. I have a hundred thousand dollars in cash value. Or if I need could, a little bit more, give me however much I need to make me have be able to put in a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. So typically you could borrow up to 90% of the cash value. Okay. So if you wanted um, to borrow, uh, if you want to take out a hundred thousand, you would probably need just $120,000 in cash value to borrow out a hundred thousand roughly okay. speaking. Okay. So let's say I've got 120,000. So now I need to borrow a hundred thousand. I send my paperwork to mm -hmm. the insurance company. Do they send the check to mm -hmm. me or do they send the check to whatever I'm going to invest in to the sponsor? How does that work? So you get to decide where you want the money sent to. So you could have a, a, as a check to you, or it could go to your checking, your checking account or savings account of your choice. So they would ask you, where do you want to deposit it to? And then you get to decide where you want to deposit it to. Okay. So now I've borrowed that money. It didn't mm -hmm. really come out of my own account. I borrowed it and used my policy, I'm assuming as the collateral for that loan. Mm -hmm. If I died before I put that hundred thousand dollars back, they'll pull it out of my death benefit. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. Okay, so what interest rate do I have to pay or do I have to pay an interest rate on that money that I've borrowed now against my policy? So you are borrowing the money from the insurance company's general funds. So okay. you're so there is an interest rate that goes to the insurance company. It's typically 5% simple interest and that's there's a difference between simple interest and compound interest. So simple interest is is for example, you take out a $10,000 loan, 5% simple interest that's $500 in interest that you would pay. So now you're, and, and let's say on an annual basis, you you paid back, your outstanding loan is $10,000. You would owe $500 on top of that. So your current balance is $10,500 owed to the insurance company. Okay. If it's compound interest, they would take 10,000, add on the 5% compound interest on that. So that's 10,500. And then charge you another 5% interest on that, either on a monthly basis or on an annual basis. So okay. it compounds on onto it. You want to, you always want to buy on the simple interest side. You want to pay simple interest. And here's the catch, Felicia, is that you are earning compound interest on your money. Uh, you buy money at simple interest and you're earning at compound interest, which creates something called, something known as an arbitrage, a split, the mm -hmm. difference between what it costs you and what you earned. Okay. So we, this is the first time you brought that up. So let's talk about how am I earning compound interest on my money? Mm-hmm. So the, the company is giving you, um, they have two ways of increasing your cash value. One way is through compound interest that they guarantee you in writing. So they'll say, uh, over the next 20 years, we're going to guarantee you um, if you paid X amount of dollars per year, if you, for example, paid $10,000 per year, we're going to guarantee you an interest rate at this amount for the next, actually for the life of the policy. You, you just pay for 20 years, but for the life of the policy, we're going to guarantee you a set interest rate. Okay. On top of that, we're also going to give you a portion of our profits, also known as dividends, Although dividends are not guaranteed, we only work with insurance companies who have, been, who have been paying dividends for well over 160 years. So here the insurance company is saying, this is the minimum we'll give you, the interest plus dividends. And then that's how your money compounds over time. So again, we're only dealing with insurance companies who have been paying dividends throughout history. Got and it. that's how your money grows. It grows through compound interest plus dividends. 
all right, we're going to go back to the, I'm now a borrower of my own money. So I've borrowed my money. I've put it into mm -hmm. my investment. I'm paying 5% simple interest to the insurance company. So, mm -hmm. and you're, you talked about arbitrage, which was a really hard word for me to understand what it meant, but I, I get it. It's the difference you make in your, in your payment. So you mm -hmm. got, you have arbitrage there, but the other place you're going to have arbitrage is you're making whatever your return is on the money you've put in. So let's mm -hmm. say you've got your investment. That's a 20% return. Mm -hmm. So you're, and you're paying 5% simple, you're making 20% over here. So you're actually making 15. You, I mean, there's no reason not to do that, right? It makes sense mm -hmm. to me all day long. Mm -hmm. And over time, you're also paying back. So you're putting money into your account all the time, just like you're, like you're paying your mortgage payment. That's the thing. You can't forget to pay your mortgage payment. You borrowed a hundred thousand dollars out of your account. You got to pay it back and you're paying it back mm -hmm. to yourself. Mm -hmm. So don't get caught up in that. Mm -hmm. I got to pay it back thing. It's going back to you one pot from one pocket to the other pocket, one pocket to the other pocket. Mm -hmm. This is really a brilliant thing. And it, it be, you start to really think like a bank. It just makes a ton of sense mm -hmm. to me. What else, what else do I need to understand about this? You're in the, you talked about. Oh, so we talk, oh, do, oh, I was going to say taxes too play a huge role in oh, this. Beautiful. Thank you. Go ahead. How so so the growth of the money as it's growing and earning dividends and interest in the account as the account is climbing, that, that cash value is growing tax deferred. So this means that you don't have to claim this on your taxes every year that, hey, you're, you're earning all these interest and dividends in the, in the policy you have to claim. You don't have to, it's tax deferred. And then in most situations, in about, I think 90%, 90% of the situations we help clients with, it's going to come out tax free. So this way, for example, um, you would use after-tax dollars to fund the policy, right? For example, you, you you have your job, you pay taxes on that money. It goes into the policy after tax. It grows tax deferred, and then when you take that money out in the later years, um, it comes out tax-free. Now, so you have a tax-free retirement because you've already paid taxes on that money. Huge tax advantages for this in this situation. Now, how do I get money um, out of that even thing? If there I are have, it, how do I get money out of it if mm -hmm. I haven't died? You're you make you're talking about I have a tax-free retirement. Uh-huh. So, so since we are talking about whole life insurance and there's two parts to whole life insurance, you know, as mentioned, there's a cash value and then there's the life insurance. Mm -hmm. The cash value can come out two different ways. It can come out as a withdrawal or as a loan. So typically, and they both have their reasons. So let's say, for example, you're still working, you're still in, in your job and you're, you're using that money. We recommend that to be borrowed money. So okay. you're borrowing against the policy and then paying that back. Uh, and then once you retire now, let's say, for example, you're at the age of 70 now and you have a million dollars in cash value. Now you can sit back and just earn like $50,000 a year as a, almost like a pension that you could just earn back from the policy. It's not a pension, just to be clear, but it, it, the same concept of just sitting back, earning passive income from the policy. That's what a lot of clients do. They set up the policy that way. So that way it just pays them every month or every year on a recurring basis. Um, alongside if they actually do have a pension, their social security, their 401k or other places, but a whole life insurance policy could be used to fund a tax-free retirement. Very interesting. Uh, do you have a, or do you teach a course? Do you have a webinar? Do you have, how do you, how do you get all this information to people? It's a lot of information. I think this concept is a little difficult to understand as far as and I, and I believe it's mm -hmm. difficult to understand mm -hmm. mostly because we have a concept in our mind of whole life insurance and it's hard to break that mm -hmm. down. So you first have to break that down before you can, and then get into all the things that this can do. Mm -hmm. I think people need, I think everybody needs to understand this. I think it's, when I heard about it, I was like, how come I didn't hear about this before? This is like one of those things you should know early, mm -hmm. early in life. My daughters know about it and both of them have their policies. They're in their twenties. I've been, I've been mm -hmm. told, and it makes sense. The younger you are that you get this started, the better off you're going to be because it just, mm -hmm. it has that much more time to grow. Exactly. So how do we get this word out to everybody who, I, everybody should know about this to me. We, mm -hmm. we all have life insurance. Why not get the one that's going to benefit you more than just when you die or benefit your beneficiaries when you die to benefit, benefit you while you're alive. Mm -hmm. Explain, ex tell me, how, how do I get more people to understand this? How do you get more people to hear this? Let's get it around the world. Yeah, so I do a lot of guest podcasting. I've done over a hundred shows, uh, over a hundred shows as a guest speaker, mm -hmm. and then I just started the podcast, Thinking Like a Bank. So those those are the two biggest ways I plan on promoting it. Also on LinkedIn, I share a lot of content on LinkedIn to bring people into the guest podcast that I do, as well as um, to our podcast, hopefully. And there's a lot of books out there as recommended. The Bank on Your There's one book called The Bank on Yourself Revolution by Pamela Yellen, who invented the Bank on Yourself concept. 
and then uh, becoming your own banker by Nelson Nash, okay. who uh, founded the infinite banking concept. And both are similar, the infinite banking concept and the bank on yourself concept, just different branding and different trademarks behind them. Okay. But those are two books I recommend. Also, if you go to Google or YouTube and you search infinite banking or bank on yourself, you come across a lot of content. And we recommend, we recommend clients to kind of get an understanding of this. Also, if you reach out to us, you could, uh, we'll give you a free copy of the book, Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash. And if you want to just have like, um, like a demo call where we just go through like a few presentations, we could do that too, just to give you like a quick uh, understanding of how this concept works. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask them on that question. And then typically we have an intro call just to see, you know, what this concept is or how it works. And then after that, we move into a financial analysis call. And the financial analysis call is a deeper dive. It's a specific, we're, we're, we're understanding your specific situation, which is a mm -hmm. must when you do this. Mm -hmm. This isn't mm -hmm. something that every person can have the same policy with the same funding amounts. Everybody's different and everybody needs their, their own recommendations. So this is where the analysis comes in. We go through your retirement accounts, cash flow, your income. If you're married, what the either spouse is doing for work. And we kind of get understanding of where you're heading, where, you, where your family's heading financially and where you want to go. What's your vision of it? We, we tend to, we, the most important part about it is the unique standpoint that the financial analysis takes, meaning that everybody has their own unique way of what they want to do with their money. So it's not like everybody's going to fit into this should category where you should go, you should have X amount of dollars in retirement. You should be in this place at this time. That's all, you know, the word should have, just to be clear, is based on a belief system, right? right. And we're not talking right. about um, being confined within a certain belief system with your money. You could do whatever it is that you want to do with your money, and everybody has those reasons. But we want to understand those reasons so that we can help you get there. And that's what the financial analysis comes in. Got and it. then after that, it's the personalized solution. This is where we, we, we present the solution to you based off of what we uncovered in the analysis. And then after that, we would uh, typically use one of the three companies we talk about. And then or it might be, two, it might be more than one. It might be two, one company, two companies, one for each spouse, for example, or one person might do two different companies. It all comes down to the analysis. The analysis tells us where to go. Okay. And then after that, we do six month review, recurring meetings with our clients. Every six months, we, we give them a call. We review their cash value. We review, if they're real estate investors, we, we review the real estate portfolio, how everything is going with what's, what's, what's working, what's not working. If uh, any problems we need to uh, uncover or opportunities we need to take. And we keep it positioned to the, to the goal they're on to make sure they get to their goal. Got it. That's a lot. I wonder, I, I can imagine people being afraid. The part that, that I, that brought up a little bit of fear in me is, is, oh my gosh, I mean, I've got to look at my financial mm -hmm. picture right now. Yes, you do. Yes, mm -hmm. you need to. Yes, you should. We, again, should, as Siri said, as a belief system, but I really, really believe that if mm -hmm. you can't, you can't get anywhere, you can't go where you want to go unless you know where you're starting. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to money, the only way to know where you're starting is to look at it and you got to look at it hard and just know it's like, okay, well, this is where I am now. Mm -hmm. Siri and his group can help you figure out how to get where you want to go using the products that they have. And I think it's an amazing thing. It doesn't sound like Siri's a guy who's going to say, this is the only thing there is. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways to get where you need to go. If your life doesn't match what he's got, he's going to get you where you need to go, or at least help mm -hmm. direct you and let you know that this, this isn't for you. What's the least mm -hmm. amount of money that you, that you need to have to be able to invest in one of these? How, how small of a policy really can you no get? Minimum, okay. But we, we typically recommend it for it to be around um, a minimum of $300 per month. Um, okay. That's where you could start seeing the growth. If it's under $300 a month, it won't really grow that substantially over time. Since we are dealing with compound interest, the more you can add into the compound interest account, the more you can get back. So we, we typically do a base off of around $300 per month. That's typically the, the minimum. That, that's okay. actually how much I started my first policy with was $300 per month. Okay. Um, with the option to add in a few extra thousand dollars a year on top of that to max out the policy, but still keep it on the tax-free side. Got it. $300, $300 a month. I was like $300,000. $300 a mm -hmm. month today mm -hmm. might sound like a lot of money to a lot of people, but 300 it's that's we, I, I bet if you made an appointment, talk to Siri and his group, and you can't see where $300 could come from, they could help you see where $300 a month could come from to be able to Absolutely. become your own bank. This is, mm -hmm. this is important stuff, you guys. I want you to go to moneywithmission.com, go to our resources page. And we're going to have contact information for Siri there. So you can get his, get the book, 
Siri and I might be talking about mm -hmm. doing a webinar. I'm springing that on him right now so that mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. spend some time talking about this. He, I've seen him do another podcast where he had pictures and he had the whole thing drawn out and it was easier to understand when you can see it drawn out. So I think this is important mm -hmm. enough to spend some more time on it. And so we we will uh, likely, if, if he'll agree to it, get him back here to do a webinar for us. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much for coming on. I really, really appreciate it. Until next time, you guys, see you later. You've been listening to Money with Mission. There are projects happening right now where you can make a great return while positively impacting the lives of others. To learn more about today's guests or to download seven steps to building resilient wealth for women, visit www.moneywithmission.com. I hope you enjoyed the interview and are inspired to give your money a mission. Until next time, send your investment dollars into the world to bring you a financial return and improve the lives of others.